So molecular shape affects molecular polarity. We talked about polar bonds and electronegativity. Um, it's, it's much simpler in a diatomic molecule with just two atoms. If the bond is polar, then the molecule's polar. So the example would be hydrogen chloride. Uh, chlorine's more electronegative. It draws the electron density away from the hydrogen. Um, so the chlorine end is partially negative. The hydrogen end is partially positive. This molecule has a dipole moment. One end is negative and one is positive. If you have a polyatomic molecule, more than two atoms, then you have to look at the geometry and the polarity of the bonds. So you look at individual dipole moments for each bond and see how they add up. So let's look at something simple first, carbon dioxide. So here's carbon dioxide. We're ignoring the lone pairs on the oxygens because they don't come into play. This carbon has two electron groups, double bond, double bond. So they are on opposite sides of each other. It's linear. Each of these bonds, though, is polar. Oxygen's more electronegative. So this oxygen's pulling the electron density this way. This oxygen's pulling electron density away from the carbon in the opposite direction. This is like two people playing tug of war, right? If this is the red line in the middle of the rope and you have two equally strong people pulling in opposite directions, nothing's going to move. Right? These forces add in such a way that they cancel each other out. So if we look at the overall electron density for that molecule, we can't say that one end of it is more positive or more negative than the other. The electron density is pulled towards the outside, but we don't have one end bigger than the other. So dipole moments are vector quantities. You guys remember what vectors are? Yeah, a vector is like an arrow. It, it has a magnitude, how long it is, and it also has a direction. It's pointing in a particular direction. And so instead of just adding 2 plus 2, you have to think about, well, what direction are they pointing in? The very simplest thing is, is just on a number line, when you, you restrict things to two dimensions, you have positive numbers and negative numbers, right? And you add a positive 2 and a negative 2, and they add up to 0. That's what's going on here. We're adding one in the negative direction and one in the positive direction. They're canceling each other out. So direction um, for these dipole moments, the direction is going to be pointing to the more electronegative atom in that particular bond. The magnitude is going to be proportional to the difference in electronegativity between the bonding atoms. The magnitude is not usually going to be a big factor for us. We're mostly looking at directions. So if we look at water, so water has a bent structure, a bent shape. We just talked about why that is. So each of these hydrogen-oxygen bonds is a polar bond. The oxygen end is more negative, so the arrow, the vector, is pointing towards the oxygen, and on this this bond, the arrow is pointing towards the oxygen. So when we take these two vectors and add them together, we get this dotted line vector going straight up. If you think of this as being a strong person playing tug of war with two small children, perhaps, they're pulling off at angles, and he's trying to win for both of them, he's just going to keep backing up and drag them along, right? They're not strong enough to counteract and at that angle, they can't do that either. So water is a polar molecule. The oxygen end is partially negative, and the hydrogen end is partially positive. And that has a huge impact on the chemical and physical characteristics of water. OK, so when, when we're tr predicting whether a molecule is polar or not, we need to draw the Lewis structure and identify the molecular geometry. We need to see, does it contain polar bonds? It may not. If none of the bonds are polar, then the molecule cannot be polar. Um, you'd want to indicate which bonds are polar and identify the directions 
And then you have to figure out, do those polar bonds add together to form a net dipole moment, or do they add up to zero? Do they cancel each other out? If the vector is summed to zero, it's nonpolar. If there's a net vector, the molecule's polar. Okay, so those are the more rigorous things. Let's briefly talk about vector addition. So, yeah, I was talking about vectors, positive and negative numbers. That's not two dimensions, that's one dimension. Um, in one dimension, the vectors lie on the same line. This is like the carbon dioxide. And so you just pick a, pick a direction as positive, and then the other is going to be negative. And so if you have plus 5 and plus 5, they're going to add together and make plus 10. If you have negative 5 and positive 10, they're going in opposite directions, but this one's stronger, and so there's still a net dipole overall. It'll be plus 5. If they are equal in magnitude and exactly opposite in direction, then they will add up to 0. They exactly cancel each other. So that would be a nonpolar molecule. In two or more addition, two or more dimensions, um, what you do is you, t you draw the draw the vectors. So here I've got a vector going in this direction and I've got a vector going in that direction. To add those, what I want to do, let's make this green perhaps, is I want to draw a parallelogram. Okay, so I'm drawing a line here that's parallel to this vector and then I'm drawing a line here that's parallel to that vector. The sum of those vectors is going from one corner to the other. So that's how you would draw you'd figure out vector addition in two dimensions. If you've got three or more vectors, deal with them two at a time. So here I've got three, four, no, three vectors. The red one is, is an addition. So just take two of them here. I'm taking A and B, and I'm adding those to get R. And then I'm taking R and adding it to C to get R prime. Don't try to do three or more at a time. Just do two and then do the third one. So here I have A, B, and C. What molecular shape might result in something like this? A trigonal planar, right? There's three things. So what if this was, um, maybe that was boron in the middle and fluorine on the sides. Three electron groups and the vectors, the dipoles are pointing out towards the fluorines. They're equal in magnitude but spread out evenly in space. So you add these two together and you get that and you add that one to this and you end up with zero. So even though this molecule has polar bonds, it's a nonpolar molecule. Um, these are common cases where you could end up with um, a polar molecule. Um, bent molecules are often polar. Um, trigonal pyramids are often polar. Linear, trigonal planar, and tetrahedral, when there's no lone pairs, are going to end up be usually being nonpolar. Okay, so all of that probably made your eyes glaze over. So here's my shortcut. This does not work all the time, but it works most of the time, and I think it's a lot easier, okay? So, a molecule is nonpolar if both of these conditions are true. There are no lone pairs on the central atom. If you see lone pairs on the central atom, done, it's polar. It's going to be polar. Um, if all of the atoms bonded to the central atom are the same, or if they have the same electronegativity. The thing is that if all the atoms have the same electronegativity, they're spread around evenly and there's no lone pairs, it's going to be nonpolar. So both things are true, it's nonpolar. Let's do an example. Determine if CF4 is polar. What do we have to draw first? Lewis structure. So there's carbon and fluorine. And then 
You always got to put those lone pairs in to make sure that you don't have double bonds or something weird. So I've got 28 electrons from the fluorine and 4 from the carbon, so 32, 20, 28, yeah, 28, 4 is 32. So there's our Lewis structure. So the more rigorous way is to identify the structure and the shape of this, which is tetrahedral, and then identify how the um, how these are pointing in space. They're all equal in magnitude, blah, 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 add them together. Let's just do the shortcut. Are there any lone pairs in the central atom? No. Are all the atoms bonded to the central atom the same? Yeah. What is it? Nonpolar. Not easier. But I will tell you, it doesn't always work. But in Chem 1A, it's going to be good enough. At least you've heard the real way. Right? What if, what if, instead of a fluorine here, I had iodine? It's going to be polar now. Ooh, burn. <laughs> no lone pairs, but iodine and fluorine have different electronegativities. So even though those vectors are opposing each other, this one is not as strong as the others. And so it will have an overall dipole moment. Yes? Fluorine's the most electronegative. Yep. And I would like you to be able to do a good job of predicting and getting it correct most of the time. And so that's why I'm telling you these shortcuts, because they work most of the time. So the, the polarity thing, and then with electronegativity, if these are all the same like they were with fluorines, obviously they're the same electronegativity. If you don't have access to an actual chart giving you electronegativities and you see iodine in here, assume that they're different, okay? And that usually works. There are a few that are the same, like carbon and sulfur have the same electronegativity. Well, you're probably not going to run into one like that that you're going to get messed up on. And when you go on to your next class, you know, you'll get more, more tools for doing that. Any questions? So we put the iodine in there, and now it's polar. Because it, no lone pairs is still true, but both things have to be true. Okay. So the polarity of a molecule is very important. So polar molecules are attracted to each other. So here we have representations of water molecules. The hydrogen is a little bit positive. The oxygen's a little bit negative, and they're attracted to each other like opposite poles of magnets. This is a picture. I really need to get some of these marbles. These are magnetic marbles. They clump together. You can imagine how that would work. These are regular glass marbles. They don't stick together. In fact, if you put them on the floor, they tend to go everywhere. One time I moved my refrigerator, and just because I was so blown away by the number of marbles, I actually counted them. 88 marbles under my refrigerator. <laughs> what? We used to have an ice cream bucket full of marbles. And then I just started throwing them away whenever I came across them. Uh, so we have fewer marbles in the house now. But you can see what would happen here. These solid colored marbles are magnetic. They're going to clump together. They're going to push these out. And so they're not going to mix very well. Polar molecules don't mix well with nonpolar molecules. Oil is nonpolar, water is polar. They don't mix very well. It's also a little bit like cliques in high school, right? These people really like each other, they're very attracted to each other, they're stuck on each other, right? And so they're all just all chit chatty together and they just push everybody else out. It's sad. Okay. And this explains how soap works, which I think is a, a nice practical application. My kids have been into baking 
well, actually, since, since they were old enough to do anything like that. And you sometimes have to grease a pan, right? And you put the Crisco in the pan, and you get all of your fingers. Can you just go rinse it off? Or if you get butter on your hands, will it just rinse off with water? No, it doesn't. Why not? Well, because Crisco is a fat, an oil. And oils are nonpolar, and they don't mix with water. So the best thing to do is take a paper towel and get most of it off, and then use some soap to get the rest of it off. How does soap work? Well, soap acts as sort of a mediator. Soap has a polar head and then this long chain that is nonpolar. The polar head gets along with the water molecules, and the nonpolar tail interacts with the grease or the fat. And so these end up, I don't think I have a picture of that. No, I don't. They form what are called micelles. And so you'll have this, um, you've got a glob of grease, and the soap molecules will stick their tails into the grease with their heads out. So these are the polar heads, and those will interact with the water molecules. And so they'll, what they'll do is they'll take a little glob of grease and get their tails in there, and they're all chummy together. They're nonpolar interactions. But because on the outside of this little glob, are polar sections, then the water's like, oh, hey, hi, and, and lets it go by. And so it allows it to break up into small pieces and get rinsed away. Any questions? <laughs>